devotion for today. Good morning. Jesus, just a mention of your name. Let's stand on our feet. Jesus, Jesus, at the mention of your name, every Jesus, my Jesus, oh, you are saved. time has changed but God has not same God yesterday same today Kind of want to read 
this chapter. Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Because through Christ, Jesus, the law of the spirit, who gives life, has set you free from the law of sin and death. For what the law was powerless to do because it was weakened by the flesh, God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh to be the sin offering. And so he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fully met in us who do not live according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. Those who live according to the flesh have their mind set on what the flesh desires, but those who live in accordance with the spirit have their mind set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. You, however, are not in the realm of the flesh, but are in the realm of the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God lives in you, and if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, they do not belong to Christ. But if Christ is in you, then even though your body is subject to death, because of sin, the spirit gives life because of righteousness. And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, who raised Christ from the dead, will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Therefore, brothers and sisters, we have an obligation, but it's not to the flesh to live according to it. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the misdeeds of the body, you will live. For those who are led by the spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies with our spirit. We are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through worldless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and who have been called according to his purpose. 
For those who God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of the son that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. How will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any change against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died. More than that, who was raised to life? Is it at the right hand of God and is also interceding, interceding for us? Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble, a hardship, a persecution, a famine, a coronavirus, our nakedness, our danger, our word, as it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors. Through him who loved us, for I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons, nor the present, nor the future, no any powers, neither height, nor debt, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen. This is the holy word of God. Lord, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you for... The God of the word, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who the word became flesh and dwelt among us, tabernacled with us. And Lord, today we come to celebrate who you are, what you are, and what you mean to us. As the song says, Father God, if you don't do anything else, You've already done enough when you gave us your son, Jesus Christ. Because of Jesus Christ, we can wave our hands. Because of Jesus Christ, we can lift up our voices. Because of Jesus Christ, we can walk into this sanctuary today and say, we know a God who is good. Because of Jesus Christ, we can celebrate the fact that we do not have to die in our sins. But Lord, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. Because were it not for Jesus Christ, we would not be in here today. Were it not for Jesus Christ, we would not be in our right minds today. Were it not for Jesus Christ, we would not have a reasonable portion of health and for strength. Were it not for Jesus Christ, we would not our, know our left from our right, our up from our down, our in from our out, Lord. So we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ. We didn't deserve it, didn't do anything to earn him. But Lord, thank you for loving us enough that you will allow us to not die in our sins but allow him to take our place. Lord, we don't take that lightly. So we come in here today to show you how much we're thankful for. We've been celebrating all week long individually, personally, with our families, on our jobs, in our homes. But Lord, we come together today as the children of God to celebrate the fact that you are good to celebrate the fact that last Sunday was not promised to be here this Sunday. So, Lord, we come in here to celebrate the fact that you are good, you are merciful, you are kind, you are loving, and you deserve all of our praise, all of our honor, all of the glory. So, Lord, we ask that you would block out all the distractions, anything that would not be pleasing to you for the next 90 minutes, for however long we're gathered in this place this morning. And when we leave out, Father God, that we would not just say we came and we had a good time and we sung some good songs and heard a preach word, but we heard from you and it allowed us to change our hearts, change our minds, transform us so that we can walk out of here and be the children of God and that the world would know that there is something different about us. Lord, 
we won't ask you to bless this service because we know that it's already blessed. Ask us, ask you that you would enthuse us, that you would give us the vigor and vitality that we need to worship you on this day. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Allow me to do this. At this time, we are preparing for our Resurrection Sunday. That's the second Sunday of next month. Um, so since our children and youth are not rehearsing, I'm sorry, since they are not singing today, they will be rehearsing. So all children, um, parents, if you know that your child will be here on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, we would allow you or ask you to allow them to transition at this time. If you guys will not be here on Easter Sunday, then they will stay in worship with you this morning. Amen? Amen. So let's give them a hand as they come and make their transition at this time. Ushers, I will ask if any other parents uh, come once we transition that you would allow their child to go to the outreach center as well. Let us hear from our men's choir at this time.
got two on this side that love Jesus. How many on this side? We got about four or five. Okay, all right. I love to call on the name of Jesus. I love to call on the name of Jesus. I love to call on the name of Jesus. I love. Yes, I do. I love. Yeah. I love to call on the name of Jesus. I love.
thank you this morning, Lord. We first thank you for our health and strength. Because we know there's nothing that we've done or said that, it, that, that would, would cause you to give us the health and strength that we have, but because of your goodness, your mercy, and your grace. You allowed us to get up this morning, come and worship your name once more. Things may not be like we want them to be in our body, but we thank God they are what they are. Thank you for the aches and the pains. Thank you for the moanings and the groanings. Because in all of that, you're still good. And we thank you this morning, Lord. We thank you for what you've done in our life personally. And we thank you for what you've done in the Good Shepherd family life as a whole, Master. Thank you for bringing Brother Wheaton back with us this morning. Was in the hospital Thursday, but he's here this morning. And we understand it was only because of your grace, your mercy, and your power that he's here with us this morning. We thank you for Sister, uh, Sister uh, Addison, Allison, Master. Sister Ellison, Master, uh, we know you're having, you're having your way in her life. Continue to bless and keep her, Master. Continue to hold her in your hand. We thank you for Sister Savannah, Master. You know what's going on in her body right now. We thank you for every breath she takes because we know you are the giver of every breath. We thank you for Brother Dave Callahan, Master. We thank you for the short steps he may be taking. But we understand that you are the strength in his life. Continue to bless and keep him, Master. Master, there are so many others we can call that you've allowed to see this day, that you've blessed in a special way. We thank you this morning, Lord. Then, Master, we pray for those that are going through a season of bereavement. You know their hearts and you know their minds. You know what's going on with them right now. We pray for Grinda, Master, as she's going through a season of not only Grinda Master, we pray for the East family. And they're going through their season of loss. There's so many others, Master, that have lost loved ones. But we know you know about it. So we come casting our cares on you this morning. Because we know you, know, you care for us. Then, Master, we pray for the one that's going to stand in this place this day. We pray now that you would take over his mind, his body, and his soul. That he would speak to us as you spoke to him, Master. That he would say to us what we need to hear. That we will become more of what you want us to be. And we look with anticipation. Because we know you're going to cause a change in our life today. As a result of us sitting at your feet. And hearing what you say to our lives, Master. Master, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Lord. This is our prayer. In Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen and thank God. I uh, told, my, told my wife this morning, um, you heard the pastor Tim pray, he prayed for the uh, the East family, many of us are familiar now with Brother East, uh, he visits us, um, I guess, four or five times a year now, he was here, I think the last fourth Sunday of the month, uh, definitely here for the musical, uh, he was, uh, am I saying it right, baby girl, um, Hadley, uh, 53 years old, um, died over the weekend, still uh, awaiting to see exactly what took place with her, uh, but 
it, it reminds us of what the brevity of life. And I said to Marcy, I'm going to ask the Lord to help me treat everybody like they're about to die. I'm going to ask the Lord to help me to think that way. Uh, because life is so brief. And, um, and uh, we, don't, uh, we don't think about it really until, until death does happen. Uh, but if we would just learn to just treat each other. Because every, every time we are together could be the last time. There's no, there's no guarantee for any of us that, that we're going to be here beyond what we are right now. Uh, our hope is that we do make it to tomorrow, that we get to be you know, older and all of that. But God didn't promise us that. He didn't, he didn't tell us it was going to be that. So we certainly pray for that for the East family. And um, uh, just again, just that reminder uh, of uh, just how brief life truly is. Um, and and I'm, I'm, I'm going to say this to us as a congregation. I'm not, it's not part of the message, but just as a word of, of encouragement to us. You know, the Lord tell us in his word, take no thought for tomorrow. He tell us to worry about nothing. Matter of fact, he say, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, now, here is what I, what I want to say. Uh, the coronavirus is another one of those nothings. Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? He put it in his word, be anxious for nothing. And I'm saying he's saying it to you and I who are believers. It, it, the, the world is going to do what the world does. Um, because they have no other recourse other than to rely on their own human wisdom. But for us, who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, even though we're hearing about it, the word of God still applies. Be anxious for nothing. But in prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God with thanksgiving. Thank you, Sienna. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will do it, will guard our hearts and our minds. And we need Jesus to guard us right now. If not, we're going to panic and we're going to make bad decisions. Uh, we need him to guard our hearts uh, and to guard our minds because he said, be anxious for nothing. And then he even told us in his word, we need to be ready to die. He told us that. We need to be ready. We need to be ready. We don't know when it's going to happen. Matthew chapter 6. grateful to God to see some of our friends from the Lakeland Baptist Church with us here on today uh, in worship with us. Good to see you all. Great to see you all. Uh, Matthew chapter 6, again, just for our reading, we, um, if, if, you, if you're starting to say, man, I wish we could go to something else, it means you're starting to get it. <laughs> that means you're just starting to get it. If you, that's what's in your mind. Lord, when is he going to go to something else? That means you just about getting it now. So let's go to Matthew chapter 6, just as a reminder to us again, starting at verse 5, and we're going to read up to verse 15 for our edification. It says, and when you pray, you shall not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the corners of the street, that they may be seen by men. And surely I say to you, they have their reward. But when you pray, Go into your room, and when you have shut your door, yes, pray to your father who is in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. And when you pray, do not use vain repetitions as the heathen do, but because they think that they will be heard for their many words. Therefore, do not be like them, for your father knows the things that you have need of, before you ask him, so you ask, why do I need to pray? He said, pray. In this manner, therefore, pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. For if you, if you, for if you forgive men their 
their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. Just again by way of subject, and I think I just added something this week. Father, please forgive us. Father, please forgive us. The grass will then the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. If there's anyone in here who could tell me all of your life as a believer you've never done anything wrong, please meet me in the study. There's anybody in here who can say, I have never, ever hurt anyone at all with a word I said or with the body language I've used. I've never done any wrong to anybody. Please meet me in the study. I need to, I need to, I need to meet with you. If there's anyone would say that I have never had the need for forgiveness, I have never had the need to say I'm sorry to anybody for anything, please. This sermon is over. Please meet me in the study because I need to know how you have done that. But I would venture to say, I would venture to say most of us, maybe one, maybe one of you in here, but I would venture to say most of us, most of us have found ourselves in life needing forgiveness. Most of us have found ourselves in life needing God to pardon us, to release us, to dismiss us from the mishaps, from the misgivings, from the misfortunes, from the times that we've spoken in ways that we probably should not have spoken. We have needed God to pardon us. We've needed God to forgive us. We've needed God to give us another chance. So we ask him, Father, please... Please forgive us. Uh, could you all do that? Put it in white for me, man. It's, it's just a little bit, a little bit off. It's acting too young. Um, and so we're reminded in the word of God that God wants us to ask him for forgiveness. Um, we, we, we have gone through this message a couple of times. Just a couple of things for us to review that will um, be a source of education edification for us when he reminds us in his word in terms of what he has done for us in, 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 in the fact that we address God as our father who is in heaven. We acknowledge him for who he is. We say again hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name as our father. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Those first six or first three petitions are addressing God for who he is. Next three is where we ask him for what we need. We say, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. And then we address him again for who he is. Yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory forever. Amen. Right in the middle, right in the middle of it all, Paul or, or, or Jesus would remind us through the right of Matthew, he would remind us through the right of Luke, is that we're to ask God to forgive us for the things that we have done in life that have been contrary to his will. That, that word again, forgive, it does mean to pardon, it does mean to release, it does mean to dismiss us from some guilt that we are experiencing. I said it on last week, but I think it's worth being reminded even now that we we request what? Release. We request pardon. We request why? Because we understand that we need forgiveness just as well as we need food. Right. Notice what he says to us in the word. Give us this day our daily bread, and there is the big conjunction, and forgive us our debts. As we forgive our debtors. And so he's reminding us, just as well as we need food on a daily basis, we also need forgiveness on a daily basis. And I know what somebody's saying. Oh, Reverend, maybe you do. But you know, I can go a whole day. I pretty much can go a whole day without sinning. I mean, I don't think nothing wrong. I don't 
say nothing wrong. I don't do anything wrong. All I know is Jesus says, when you pray, say, give us this day our daily bread. And right along with it, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That word, that word debtors is a, is a unique word. Uh, because literally what it is saying is, is that we owe God something. Yeah. It is another word uh, for sin. Thank you, baby, for encouraging pastor to preach. Thank you. That's, that's it. That's it. I wish other folk would run up here like that every now and then. Thank you, baby. It is reminding us in the word of God that we owe God. It is another word for sin. The word that often come up is the word homotias. That's the word all of us more familiar with. The word sin. But there are other words that remind us. The word paratomo it, it, another get paraptoma. It's a word again of trespasses. It's dealing again with those things that we do against the will of God. But in this case it's a unique word and the word is aphemia. And what it literally means is that it is a debt that we owe. In other words, it is something Thing that we do from a moral standpoint that if God were to charge us with that sin, we would have to make payment on what we did. So we ask him, Lord, forgive us our debts. That's where we kind of want to focus our attention. Why? Because he does remind us in his word that we request release, part or dismissal as the daily providential requirement of our father. And why do we need to do this? Is because, remember last week we talked about the fact that the first sin that all of us come into the world that we've committed is in the inherited sin of Adam, right? In Romans chapter 5 verse 12, we are, we deal with the inherited sin of Adam. The Bible reminds us because of Adam's sin, all men sin and what? All men die. So all of us, when we come into the world, we come into the world with the inherited sin of Adam. But along the way, when we hear the gospel, we hear the preacher preach, we hear the teacher teach, we hear about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, then at that point, we actually inherit the righteousness of Jesus. That's good news, y'all. We're born into the world with the inherited sin of Adam, but we inherit what? The righteousness of Jesus Christ. And now we can live out our lives pleasing God. Now we can live out our lives uh, in a, that God accepts the things that we do. We can make choices that, that, that cause God to smile. We can make choices that, that God are uh, satisfied with. We can make choices that God is, is happy with us. Why? Because we have what the righteousness of Jesus. Jesus is the only one that ever totally, absolutely, in every sense, com, com, in every sense, uh, please his father. Jesus never lied, never cheated, never stole, never never had a bad thought. He was impeccable. He could not sin. Uh, 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 it, we're reminded in Hebrews that he was our high priest, yet he was without sin. And so we're reminded of the fact that we now have the righteousness of Jesus. Could you turn to a family member and say, I got the righteousness of Jesus. Isn't that good news? Come on, won't you just give him a praise right now? We have the righteousness of Jesus. However, since we don't have to deal with the inherent sin of Adam anymore because God has forgiven us for that, uh, it has already been fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He's on the cross and he says, Father, it is finished. It's a done deal. However, we make independent choices. So even though we have the inherited sin of Adam that has been dealt with with Jesus Christ, now we have the inherited righteousness of Jesus, we also have to admit that we have, we commit some independent sins. We know what's right, but we choose to do what we do. We know what he said, but we choose to say what we say. So we sometimes act independent of the righteousness that Jesus Christ has instilled in us. And listen, and he wants us to help us understand, we can't say the devil made us do it. James would tell us we are drawn away by our own lust and we are enticed. And when that happens, he says, it brings forward what? Separation. So what happens with us now? Our fellowship with God, our walking with God, we're not as tight as it normally is. 
whenever we sin against God, whenever we rebel against God, we don't feel, we don't really feel, I'm going to use that word, we don't really feel that good on the inside. We, 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 we kind of messed up because we know we could have done something different, said something different. We could have acted in a different manner, but we chose to do act what? Independent of God. Now we just kind of feeling a little tense. But thank God we can call Jesus. Father, please forgive me. So now what we look at that second thing. He says, he says, what? Well, forgive us our debts. So what are we doing when we, when we ask him to forgive us our debts? We request release, pardon, or dismissal from the personal rebellion we repeat against God. I need God to pardon me from my personal rebellion. You know, and you know rebellion, rebellion comes in different forms. I've, I've studied some of you all, and um, um, as I study myself, and you know we rebel in a lot of different ways. Some rebellion is obvious. People just tell you, no. No. You got some little children that you tell them that, no. Nah. I'm weak. Got a little heat when I said that. I said a child said no. Got a little heated, you know. Uh, because it reminds us that there's something that a parent is saying to a child, that child that no. And, and some of y'all parents say, oh, okay, oh. No, 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 no. That's another subject altogether. But, but it's a rebellion that's automatically in all of us. Why? Because of Adam's what inherited sin, right? All right. And then, and then there's some people who who rebel. I mean, and it's I mean, it's obvious. You hear it, you see it, and people don't say it, but they'll 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 show you with that body. And you automatically mean know what that means at it. No, I do not do that. They didn't say a word, but the body language automatically said it's, it's just that rebellion that's there. And then there are some people who, who rebel silently. They look at you straight in the face. And some even smile. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look like they agree. And you're thinking in your mind, okay, we got this together. <laughs> And that person will leave you and do totally opposite because there's a kind of silent, silent rebellion. And I look sometimes, I'll be, I'll be observing some of y'all children, and I say, oh, look at that. Because, you know, your child is a smaller, younger version of you. They just look at that little child. They're rebelling on the inside. They're not saying anything, but they're not going to do what they've actually been told to do. So there's this rebellion that is in us. But what God has done, God has given us an avenue, folks, as to how we can experience his pardon. Even though we can't change the fact, we did what we did. I remember I talked about that a little bit on last week. Don't ever say, I didn't mean to say it. No, when you said it, you meant it. Don't ever say, I didn't mean to do it. When you did it, you meant it. But what we now can deal with is the guilt that comes with the rebellion that we do against God. And so, and so, and so, and so there are a couple of things that, 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 that God does for us in his word. And we can see it in Matthew chapter 5 and Matthew 6. Uh, is that, first of all, he defines our being. He defines our being. He defines our being. Look at Matthew chapter 5 for just a moment. Matthew chapter 5. He defines our being. Um, and when you look at, and I'm not going to look at all, read all of these verses, but, it, but when you start off with Matthew chapter 5, and seeing the multitude, he went up on the mountain. And when he was seated, his, his, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth with, and taught them, saying, and notice again, bless all the poor in spirit. Bless all they who mourn. Bless all the meek. Bless all those who hunger. Bless all the merciful. Verse 8. Bless all the pure in heart. Verse 9. Bless all the peacemakers. Verse 10. Bless all those who are persecuted. And what he is doing here is he defines our being. It's who we are. And you know the language we often use, and, and, and I don't say it is improper, but you know we often say to each other, God bless you. You know you don't really have to tell a believer to God bless you. Because the reality, as a believer, I'm already blessed. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3 says, we are, uh, Blessed be the, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, notice, who has blessed us with 
every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I'm already blessed. But here's what God wants us to do. He wants us to live who we be. What he's saying, you are blessed. So now live. Woo, I love it. You already blessed. So live who you be. I'm sorry, Monique. I'm sorry. I know that's bad language. But y'all get what I'm saying? You feel it like that, right? Li live who you are. Live, live who you are. That's so I can get a proper grade from Monique right now. But I'm going to say it like I said. Live who you be. Because what it is saying is that I am already blessed. When he talks about the be attitudes, it's who I be. It's who I am. And now what he says, live out who you are. So now, he gives us all of that in chapter, in, in chapter 5, verse 1, basically through verse 20, verse 19. But then he reminds us in verse 20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness would exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Because here is the, the, the issue that, 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 that they were dealing with, and we've got to be careful that we uh, 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 avoid it, is that we don't operate from a standpoint of self-righteousness. Because when it comes to righteousness, God is the one who defines who we are. God is the one who defines righteousness. Now, we go from being, and here's the second thing. He talks about, he defines our being, but he also describes our behavior. He describes our behavior. So I, I did a, we did a little bit of that on last Sunday, but I want to I I help you to see that if the people of God that, that Matthew wrote to had nothing else to know how to, no, no other way to know how to live. Uh, those who heard what Jesus said and didn't have, remember the scriptures like we have it, they didn't have a personal Bible like we have it. How would they have known how to live blessed? How would they have known, watch this, when, they, when, when Jesus is saying, uh, 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 forgive, we would pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Where would they have, how would they have known the standard that would have determined whether or not they needed forgiveness from God or not? And I'm glad you asked. It would, it, it's what Jesus had previously said in chapter 5. Remember, verse, look at verse 21. He says, you, you have heard that it was said, uh, those of old, you shall not what? Murder. Notice, and what's amazing about that, when we look at the Ten Commandments, the first commandment God gave as it relates to our, one of the, our relationship with, with, with each other is honor your mother and your father, and the next thing he said, thou shalt not kill. So Jesus, in a very real sense, is setting up this covenant relationship that we have as a part of his kingdom, and he's saying to us, don't murder. And I know what all of us would say, I never killed anybody. I would never do that. I would never shoot anybody. As a matter of fact, I would never even be on a jury that would kill somebody. Some of y'all, just that spiritual. You say, I never do it, Reverend. Just never do it. Never ever. Couldn't make me do it. Never would. But notice what Jesus said. He got that butt in verse 22. But I say to you that whoever is angry, anybody ever been angry with a brother? Anybody ever been angry with a sister? And I'm not necessarily talking about your biological. I'm talking about other believers. It says, but I say to you who is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of, of judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, that was a cuss word almost, um, shall be in danger of counsel. But whoever says you fool, you notice how sometimes we can be loose with our lips and we say things to people, not even what God's saying in your heart, the very, the very thing that it requires in a person's heart to actually murder somebody is the very thing that can be in our heart based upon what we can say to kill or assassinate a person's reputation, character. Does, does it make sense? That we can, that sometimes, again, we don't, we don't necessarily kill with a gun or a knife, but we kill a person's reputation. And we'll say stuff like, you better watch him. And we say that to folk that don't even know that person. Ooh, we, I hope that's not happening in our church. That there's somebody that you call yourself don't, that you don't love, that a new member come and then you sit with that person and say, you better watch. Watch. You killing that person's character. 
you're murdering that person's character. You are assassinating that person's character. Look at verse 27. He says, you have heard that it was said, those of old, you shall not commit adultery. Oh, never, never. I wouldn't, oh, no, 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 no. You could pay me a million dollars. No way, no way. But I say to you, whoever looks at a woman to lust for her has already committed adultery with her. Now, ladies, y'all not, y'all not excused. He's just, he's using masculine language, language but he talked about y'all too, all right? But, but, but no, and notice what he tells us to do in verse 29. It says, if your right hand causes you to sin, if your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. In other words, you got to do whatever you need to do because here's what he's talking about, that thoughts will come into your mind. And the Bible is saying that many times if we're not careful with the thought, in other words, that initial thought, that initial thought can actually lead to other thoughts that actually can grow to an action. So it's important. Why? Because what he's saying to us is to understand that sin can be in the heart of our mind. Or it, it generates, if you would, from the heart of our mind. Look at verse 31. Therefore, it, is, it, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give a certificate of divorce. But I say to you, whoever divorces his wife for any reason, Jesus says, except sexual immorality, causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. In other words, what he is saying to us here is that is wow, um, uh, just reminding us that adultery doesn't always have to be an action in terms of the actual um, actually being with another person if I'm married, but he's saying even in my mind, even in my mind, even in my mind, uh, the fact that I would divorce a person, if I were to divorce Marcy to just to say, you know, I just, I just, hey, we just can't, we just can't work stuff out no more. I don't like her no more. You know, she make me sick. Jesus is saying that's a wrong reason to divorce. Except again, if it would be a situation again that if I would commit adultery against her, God is saying she has a right actually to divorce me. But God is wanting me to understand that if that does happen, that if Marcia now, Marcia now, um, uh, who is free to remarry or, or now now has divorced me, and I choose not to again reconcile with her, Mar God is saying now that when Marcia chooses to remarry. And what, at any point when she consummates that marriage with her new husband, God is charging me again with adultery. That's strong stuff, y'all. He's again charging me with adultery. Now, now you see why we need to ask God to forgive us? Our, our let, 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 let's move on. Look at verse, at verse 33. Again, I say to you, to you uh, heard that heard that it was t it was said of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform your oaths to the Lord. But I say to you, do not swear at all, neither by heaven, for it is God's throne, nor by the earth. You ever you ever you ever you know you ever you ever told somebody you were gonna do something, and the person kind of didn't believe you because they were kind of suspect of your reputation. And you say, I swear to God. And we even, we even go for and say, I swear on my mama grave. You know, just, come on, y'all laugh, but y'all know we do. I, I, because we want what that wants. So, I, I swear to God. I swear to God. I swear to God. Uh, he's going to be with the Lord. Now, I'm just laughing when I say this. My grandfather used to say that. That's how he would. He, <laughs> but, but you know what the Lord is saying is that, is that we need to just let our words be few. If I say I'm going to do something, I just say I'm going to do it without having the pressure saying, I, I promise, I, I, swear, I swear to God. No, he says, let your yes be yes and let your no be no. Look at verse 37. But let your yes be yes and your no be no. For whatever is more than these is from. Oh, my goodness. So if I got to keep telling you, I swear to God, I'm going to do this, that, and the other, what he's saying, it's no longer God, it's the devil now. Look at verse 38. Again, we're talking about why we need forgiveness. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. In other words, the Old Testament pr principle would be if you hurt somebody and you actually hurt that person's eye, 
in the Old Testament, actually what could happen is that person that you that hurt you could lose that same eye yeah. on their body, right? But watch this. But notice what Jesus says. But um, I, I say to you, I tell you not to resist an evil person. What? Yeah. But whoever, s- oh, Lord, slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. And you know, I still talk to people today who act like that's not in the Bible. I know what God said, but. Well, that's the problem. Because again, when we don't, when we don't view sin properly, what he's talking about is the, re, the retaliation. In other words, I'm going to get you. You do something to me, I'm going to get you. And what he saw in that attitude is an attitude that generates from an evil heart. Just to be able to say that, no matter what they've done, oh, oh I'm going, I'm going, I'm going, and we even use the word, I'm going to get you something. I'm going to get you. I'm going to get you. One, one of the, one of the, and this is a long time ago. I remember which twin it was. It was always amazing. Uh, 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 the the, uh, the Johnson twins, Warren and Warren Jr. When they were, when they were little kids, um, uh, one of them had a habit. If you if you hit her, she was going to hit you back. It didn't matter. If you just touch her accidentally, she was going to get you back. And Warren Jr. trying to teach her, not, don't, you don't have to do that, baby. You don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. And, 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 and she had developed a, a scheme that they would tell her not to do it. They would say not to do it. And at that point, she learned in their presence, didn't do it. But I guarantee you, before the day was over, when our family would gather together, Whoever that person was that had touched her, sometimes they could be going home on her way out. She would touch her. I'm going to get you. You do something to me, I'm going to get you. But God is saying, even having that in our mind, even having it in our mind, he says, if anyone wants to sue you, take away your tunic, let them have your cloak also. And whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. What he's talking about is the attitude of vengeance. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, I will repay. But to have an attitude that I'm going to, oh, I'm going to get you. It may not be today. It may not be tomorrow. But I'm going to. Again, that is a thought of the mind. Look at, we're, we're just moving on. I want you to see things that we, we don't think about sometimes that we honestly need to ask God to forgive us. I mean, sometimes, you know, you can be driving and somebody cut in on you. If you're not careful, man, you, so, you get so tense that you just, you just can't wait. Can I get on the side of that joker? Because I oh, can't believe he passed me like that. You just get so, and we just determine we got to get that person. And we'll drive fast enough to try to get in front of them in a hurry. See, told you. Told you. No, he's saying that those are those things that, now watch this. He talk, now, now here's, a, here's a big one for me. Look at verse 43. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and what? And hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. Pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you, that you may be what? My goodness. Because that's what you want, that's what we want to to, to demonstrate. That's what we want to show. That's what we want to exemplify. You may be sons of your father in heaven, for he makes his sun rise, what, on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what, what reward have you? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? If you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. Listen, if you're in a setting, you're in a setting with people, and there's a particular person that you got a problem with, and you go around shaking hands, thank you for witnessing, baby. Uh, You go around shaking hands with everybody, except for that person. God said he got a problem with you. Because sometimes we think that's okay. Because see, I'm going to show you. You know what you did to me, so I'm going to 
I'm going to show you. Or, or we do this dismissive stuff that, that I may not go shake their hand, but I just do, you know. <laughs> like that's something big. The Lord said, that's not, that's nothing. Because it doesn't, what, it, it doesn't exemplify the love that God has for you to the point that he would give his son on a cross to die for your wicked sin, our wicked sin, all of our transgressions. He died for all of that. And then I've got nerve not to want to have anything to do. Notice again, it talks about our charitable deeds, things that we do for people. Take heed. You do, do verse, verse, chapter 6, verse 1. Take heed that you do not do your charitable deeds before men to be seen by them. Some of that stuff y'all putting on Facebook about every good thing you're doing. Jesus saying, I'm not impressed. I am not impressed. You gotta, if you gotta, if you gotta give us a, 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 a hour upon hour, all of the good stuff. I helped this person, I did, I went to the house. He said, otherwise you have no reward from your no reward. Now watch this. All your Facebook buddies, oh, you just the best thing in the world. God said, no reward. Because you're not doing it for good. You're doing it because you want folk to brag. We want folk to brag on what we did. Therefore, when you do, when you do a charitable deed, verse 2, do not sound a trumpet. Hey, look at, hey! I just went to the hospital. I just went to the nursing home. I just went at, I ain't did nothing. Tooting the home. Blowing the trunk. Not in God said, I'm not impressed with that. I need forgiveness, what he's saying. He says, why did he says again, do, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrite do in the synagogue and in the streets that they may what have what? Glory from men. Or surely I say to you. They have their reward. Listen, if you do things, what Jesus is saying, in your heart, if you do things only because you want other folks to talk about what you did, that's your reward. That's what he said. That is our reward. If I'm doing things only because I want other folk to talk about what I did. And listen, I'm, I'm serious. You sure enough got a problem. If, you know, sometimes they be talking about what somebody did or somebody, you know, somebody, and then you get up and say, hey, call me, not my name. They know what I did. They ain't call, they ain't call my name. You say, really? That's not the purpose for doing it. We do good simply because we ought to do good and not want us to be glorified by other folk. Wow. He says, when you do your charitable deed, verse 3, do not let your left hand. Oh, Lord, that's how, that's how tight you need to keep it. Don't even let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's not even possible. But as he's using hyperbole, that's what the word is used. He's using such an extreme to say, don't brag about what you did for other folk to know you did it. That your charitable deed may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret, what will he do? He will himself reward you. How? Why? Because you live in blessed. You live in blessed. You're not looking for any recognition from people. You're just living blessed. So now he talks about prayer. Then he talks about fasting in verse 16. Moreover, when you, when you fast, do not be like the hypocrites with a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces that they may appear to men to be fasting. And surely I say to you, they have, no, they have their reward. Even that sometimes. People, you know, how you doing? Oh, I'm okay. Jesus is already, in, in this case, he's talking about his TMI. Yeah. Too much information. <laughs> you don't need to say all of that. If that's what you're doing, just do it and trust the Lord with the results. Yeah, listen, I know I've, I've had some situations where, you know, um, uh, that you've gone places where people are eating and the purpose is for eating, but you're choosing. And I, and I think sometimes in respect to the host that you can say, listen, I'm just not eating today. But, but you're, not, you're not bringing attention to yourself. In other words, you know, like you're sitting. 
like you want us to ask. You know, what's going on, Leo? I mean, well, I'm, I'm finished. No, no, no. He don't want us to do that. Because, again, it's an inward indication of what's going on in the heart. I'm trying to bring attention to myself. You know what? This this, this, this is a fancy word. Everybody say ostentatious. That's what this is. It's being ostentatious. I do things to show off. I do things because I want people to brag about what I did. That's being ostentatious. Um, look at verse, verse um, um, 19. Don't, don't lay up treasure for yourself on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up what for yourself treasures where? In heaven. In other words, what God is saying to us, be careful about wanting to have stuff. Because stuff is an indication, again, of something that is going on in our mind that does not bring glory to God. And so I use the money that I ought to give to God to buy stuff that is a demonstration, again, of where my treasure really is. It's an indication of what's most important to me. It's not the things of God. It's the things of Lee. Does that make sense? Uh, just go up to chapter 7, verse, verse uh, 1. Judge not that you be not judged. For what judgment you judge, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured back to you. And why do you look at the speck in your brother's eye and do not consider the plank in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me, let me remove the speck from your eye, and look, a plank is in your own eye? Hypocrite, hypocrite. First, remove the plank from your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Do not give what is holy to the dogs, nor cast your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. In other words, what God is saying to us, be careful. And, and, and listen, the Bible actually teaches us, and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Remember, we have the situation of the brother who actually committed incest with his stepmom. Paul says this. Paul says, I've already judged to turn that one over to Satan for the destruction of his flesh, that his spirit might be saved in the day of the Lord. What the Lord is saying is that amongst ourselves, because we have the righteousness of God, there are things that we can do outside of the righteousness of God that I don't have, I'm not judging you. Watch this. You are not judging me if you hear me lie. And you know what I'm saying is a lie. And you say to me, Lee, stop lying. You're not judging me. It is not an improper judgment that you are making. But when you look at me, I mean, just look at me and decide. You see, see, he think he all of that. Just look at it. You don't know what I'm thinking. You, you, you get what I'm saying? That's making a mental conclusion in my mind about something I don't have all the facts about. So the Lord is telling us, be careful of looking at a person and making a determination on that person without even knowing the fact. Because if I do, I need to ask God to forgive me. Don't Listen, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people who praise man, they love to praise God. Don't ever say they're showing off. You don't know. And then there are a lot of people who be quiet. Be saying they ain't got the spirit. Let me, I can give y'all a wonderful example of that. Octavia Wilson, pastor's wife. Was it with the second pew? Third pew, second pew? Second pew. Used to sit in church, and we saw her as the pastor's wife for 17 years. And mostly all you got from that table. pew in front of her, space right here, this spot right here, it was a, I mean, it was all that kind of, all that kind of carrying on going on. I'm talking about, I'm talking about Rev would preach, Marshall, he preached so hard he passed out. We had to give him smelling sauce, let him come finish his sermon. I mean, it was just, it was like extreme. You look at one who was so quiet. 
but one who was. And so we could not make a, you would never ever make that determination. Sister Wilson don't have what Reverend Wilson had because she could tell him what he preached. She, she could tell you every song that the choir sung. In some kind of way, she knew when we were cutting up behind her. And she'd never look. Don't know how that kind of would, that thing would happen. But I'm just saying, don't ever judge somebody without knowing the facts. And I'm talking about that's all people. And listen, some of us got it worse than others. Because you know what it's saying? Some way, somehow, the reason that I need to ask God to forgive me is because, watch this, no, no. Notice the language that he used. Let's go back to Matthew 6. Notice the language. He says, forgive us. Forgive us. You know what God wants us to do to, 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 when he talks about forgive us? He never, ever wants us to think in any sense that we're totally better than somebody else. I'm going to say that one more time. The reason we got to pray, forgive us our debts, is because... Forgiveness reminds us that we all got something. Come on, help me, y'all. You may be mature in one area. I may be mature in another area. But there ain't none of us mature in every area. So all of us need to ask God, please forgive me. Please pardon me. Lord, please dismiss what I, forgive us. And it keeps us all what on an even keel because we are in the family of God. We're in the family of God. Jesus died for all of us. We are all the children of God. And so if I'm praying and I'm not saying, Lord, forgive us. And I'm always talking about forgive them. I'm putting myself no, 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 with God, I'm actually putting myself on a level that I don't need to be. That's it. May the Lord bless us until we meet again. I, 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 want, I, want, I want you all to do this for me just by way of assignment as our, as our leaders get ready to come. Just by way of assignment this week, would you read Daniel chapter 9? Again, with the other reading that you have, we read it through the Psalms. But I also want you, the assignment to read Daniel chapter 9. And what I want you to do is to mark in your Bible every time Daniel says we. Daniel chapter 9 and mark in your Bible every time Daniel says we. Daniel chapter 9, mark in your Bible every time you hear the word we. And to notice what he is saying, we to God, toward God. Knowing Daniel, knowing his reputation, knowing his character, but he uses the communal language of we because he did not in any way dismiss himself from what was going on in the nation of Israel and the people of Judah. Father, how we love you and thank you for the reminder that we need your forgiveness. Oh, Lord, we, we need your pardon because of our thoughts, our words, and our deeds. And, Father, we uh, never, ever want to put ourselves on a pedestal that in any way we think we're better than anybody else. <laughs> woo, woo, woo. Please remind us of that. Please remind us of that. Help us to have that mentality when we pray. That our, the language of our prayer is not I, my, but it's we, us. Not I, my, they, it's we, us. Help us to keep in mind that we owe you a debt. Every time we sin, we owe you a debt. And so God, thank you for knowing that all we got to do is ask when we ask, the word reminds us that you are faithful and just to forgive us. And you cleanse us of our unrighteousness. And for that, Lord, we are grateful. Lord, I pray for that person that may be in here today still dealing with Adam's inherited sin. 
that person who may not have yet trusted Christ as their Savior. God, I pray that even through this message that they've heard about your love. They, they have heard about how you want us to view one another. And as a result, they, 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 they believe in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, which is the only means of their salvation, the only message of salvation. Touch their hearts now as we extend this invitation. We ask it in Jesus' name and his name alone we pray. Amen. I want to ask our servant leaders, those of you who can come comfortably, brothers, if you don't have to cross, you don't have to cross over anybody. Thank you so much. Otherwise, you can just stand where you are. Thank you so much.